know, when you think about the Holy Land in our world, what country do you think of? I think of Israel or, yeah, Palestine, some people call it. And if you go to Israel, what city is typically considered the holy city? Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there's a, a mountain there that's called the Holy Mountain, sometimes known as Mount Zion or Mount Moriah. And on that Holy Mountain, they've got what they call the Temple Mount, the Holy Temple. And in the Holy Temple, they had the Holy Place, we talked about this last night. And then you had the Holy of Holies. Now, what was it that made the Holy Temple the Holy Temple? The whole temple was built around a national treasure. It was a golden box, right? Was it the golden box that was a national treasure? Or was the golden box just a container for the national treasure? The national treasure inside the temple, that holy temple on the holy mountain in the holy city, in the holy land, is a couple of rocks. And they were inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now these stones are very unusual because they are written by the finger of God. The messages there, the information there is written by God himself, spoken by his voice. Now, how many of you think it would be interesting if we could find the ark? It's probably the most valuable missing artifact of ancient history, if it could be discovered. Uh, the national treasure, not only of the Jews, but, you know, it goes back to, of course, Christians, Islam. They all recognized uh, Moses and that God had given the Ten Commandments uh, personally. And it was placed in this golden container. The important thing is not the gold. It's the rocks in the box. Would you like to find that? Wouldn't that be something? By the way, you can find it. It's in your Bible. The information in that box is in your Bible. Ah, oh, but we're all kind of enchanted with the gold. That's what it is. We want the gold box. We're not so interested in the writing on the stones. We want the treasure. The treasure is in the Word that's there. And you've got that in your Bibles. Well, I started telling you last night that God had told Jeremiah the prophet when Israel was surrounded by the Babylonian army that the doom was certain. King Zedekiah had refused to go out and surrender. God told him to, but he would not. He did not believe that uh, the city would be destroyed and the temple would be destroyed and burnt with fire. And so Jeremiah and some of the priests they did not want the ark to, to be destroyed or damaged or to fall into the hands of their enemies once it had been captured by the Philistines. Some of you remember that story from the first book of Samuel. And so it's not in the Bible, but many historians and scholars believe the only place it could be, since it's mentioned by Hezekiah and the ark appears, since Jeremiah knew the temple was going to be destroyed, he and some loyal priests hid it in a cave somewhere around Jerusalem. Now, if you've been to the Promised Land, I know Pastor Gary's been there and others here, it is absolutely honeycombed underneath the city with tunnels and caves and graves carved in the rock, and it would have been a very easy thing to find one of those, seal it up, and to hide the entrance, maybe cave it in, and uh, it has not been found from that day to the present. And obviously, they just can't take tunnel boring equipment underneath the city and just keep on boring through everything until they find it. But somewhere it is hidden still to this day. It's never been rediscovered. But I know what's in the ark. And it's in my Bible. We studied the temple last night. If your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy of Holies would be here. And in the Holy of Holies, there were the stones that had the Word of God. Now we're going to talk about that treasure in the ark tonight. Very important subject. Question number one. Did God himself really write the Ten Commandments? All of our answers are coming from the Bible. You'll get a study guide to help follow this up, but you may want to take notes also for your own benefit. It says in Exodus 31, verse 18, God gave Moses two tables of stone, testimony tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Now, I don't know if God somehow issued some ark welder out of his finger and inscribed it, 
but he somehow burned into the granite or the sapphire stone, whatever kind of rock it was, his will, probably in the Hebrew language, the Ten Commandments, that he spoke with his voice. Again, Exodus 32, 16. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So the Ten Commandments, unlike the rest of the Bible, where the Holy Spirit inspired holy men and women to write and put these things down, God said, I'm not going to risk committing this to any mortal. I am going to share this audibly with the whole nation. The whole nation of Israel heard God give the Ten Commandments. And after they agreed to the covenant, then he wrote it with his own finger. And so this deserves a special priority in our thinking, which is something to consider now that we're living in a culture where people kind of, they, they uh, slough off the Ten Commandments. As though it's just, you know, old guidelines. Number two, what is God's definition of sin? Jesus came to save us from what? From our sins. Mary was told by the angel, you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is actually in Hebrew, Yahshua, same as Joshua. And it means God is Savior. Because he will save his people, not in their sins, the angel said, from their sins. What is sin? According to the Bible, sin is the transgression of the law. Now, for instance, if you look at Joseph, and sin existed long before the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments go all the way back before God wrote them down. For instance, back in the time of Joseph, when Potiphar's wife tempted him to commit adultery, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Even back in the very beginning, when Cain killed his brother Abel, God called it a sin. Murder was a sin. Ten Commandments had not been spoken or written yet. So God's law goes all the way back to the very beginning. Because the foundation of the Ten Commandments is a representation of God's character. It's love. Now, there's several definitions for sin in the Bible besides sin is the transgression of the law. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. Sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. So sin is not just doing bad things like killing or robbing or stealing. If I walk by somebody who's been hit by a car and they're bleeding in the gutter and I don't do anything to assist them, that's called a sin of omission. You got sins of commission where you commit a sin, you lie, you steal, or so forth. And then you got sins of omission where somebody's dying of thirst and you got a bottle of water and you walk by him. You haven't done anything to him, but you omitted a duty of love that you knew you should have done. So, you know, I just want to make sure you understand all of that really is covered by the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments are very broad and comprehensive. Number three, why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Well, there's several answers here. First of all, by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's through the law of God we become aware of what is sin. Uh, I brought something up here. You may have noticed uh, here on the platform. I want to try and illustrate something. And sometimes we remember things better with a little illustration. Okay. Now, will it bother you if I carry on the lesson like this. Would it be distracting? And there's probably some of you out there that are thinking, well, Pastor Doug, he's got the mark. <laughs> All right. I don't see what you see. You might see there's something wrong with my appearance right now, but uh, I don't see anything wrong. And you might say, Pastor Doug, you need some attention with your uh, visage, but I'd say, well, I don't see. I took a bath and everything. Let's suppose that this represents a smudge of dirt. You know, I do this now with uh, duct tape. I used to do it with pen or something or mascara, and then I'd wipe it off to illustrate it. And one time I made the mistake, I got a permanent marker. <laughs> kind of messed up my illustration. I had to rub until my head was all red. So and I just use tape, and it just makes it real easy. All right, so how are you going to convince me that I've got a problem? What do I need? A mirror, a mirror I heard you say. All right, so I feel okay right now because I don't see anything wrong. I feel pretty good about myself. But, oh, that looks so silly. <laughs> I was watching an old TV program the other day where someone had taped me, and I had one of my pockets tucked in and one of my pockets out, and I was thinking, 
I never realized that. Why didn't anyone stop me and say, fix your pocket? Just keep me humble. So if I look at this and I say, oh, I felt pretty good until I looked in the mirror. Problem is the mirror. If I throw the mirror away, I'll feel fine again. Because I felt okay until this showed up. And so this is the problem. Some people have that attitude. Just throw it away and then I'm okay. Do I still have a problem in your eyes? All right. So uh, what's the answer? The mirror showed me that there's something wrong. Uh, obviously, the mirror should be able to take it away. Is that going to work? Is the function of the mirror to take away the smudge or the spot or the tape? No. I need something else. The mirror's function is simply to show me that I have a need for cleansing. So I got to find something else. So you go to, you get a washcloth, you get some soap and some water. I deliberately picked a red washcloth. You know why? Because if that symbolizes the law that shows us sin, law doesn't save anybody. It can't, it never has. Then what would this represent? The blood of Christ. Now it doesn't make any sense, I realize, how a red cloth can get a black spot off a white face. And someone else said one time, how can a black cow eat green grass and make white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand it, but it doesn't mean you can't enjoy ice cream. You may not understand how it works. I don't understand how the blood of Christ washes away sin, but it does. Trust me, it changes lives. So then I take this and let's suppose I got the soap in the water and, and all right, I take this off. This now is taking it away, but how do I know? Take your word for it. No, I'm going back to the mirror. This is not saving me from my problem, but I'm saying, oh, everything's appropriate now. How many of you, fess up, be honest, before you go out in public or you go to work, do you use one of these? Because you want to say, well, you know, do I look appropriate? Is everything straight? And it's a good idea because, you know, we've all sometimes gone out into public and we didn't know we had a big old slab of parsley in our teeth or something and we're smiling at everybody and nobody has the courage to tell us. And so aren't you thankful that you've got a mirror to let you know, hey, you look, you know, everything's okay right now. You're as good as you can be. Some of us, the mirror is just a constant reminder we're getting older. But, um, you know, you try and make things look as well as you can. And that's what it's for. Well, that's actually the purpose of the law. Law doesn't save us. The law is there to help us recognize our need of God. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And again, what is the purpose of it? Great peace have they who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. I've got a lot of confidence when before I come out in front of people that I can look in the mirror. I say, oh, okay. The mirror, yep, everything's straight. I can go now. And so you get where you're thankful for it. If you look and you see that there's a problem or there's dirt, then you can say, well, I don't like the mirror. It's not the mirror's problem. There's another issue. And again, happy is he who keeps the law. Proverbs 29, 18. Is the law there to make us unhappy or happy? It brings a blessing. And again, John, this is the New Testament. John 15, verse 11. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. The law of God is not designed to take away our happiness. It's designed so that it can be full. It can be complete. If you go on a family vacation and you're looking at uh, some beautiful scenery on a precipice or by the edge of a lake and you get your children there and you see a guardrail, would you be thinking within yourself, oh, look at that. They went and wrecked everything by putting up a guardrail. How are we supposed to have the freedom to jump? How are our kids supposed to wander off with a guardrail? Or are you glad that it's there? Well, the law of God serves something like a guardrail. It helps us know how to stay in the road because you get off the road of life and it can be fatal. And so we shouldn't be angry at the law as though it's restricting our freedom. I can just about guarantee you most of the misery that's happened in your life has been because you got off the road somehow. We bring most of our suffering upon ourselves. Not all of it, but much of it. Number four, why is God's law so important to me personally? Answer, James chapter 2 verse 12 so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. It tells us in James, just before this verse, it mentions two of the Ten Commandments specifically. 
And then yet it refers to the Ten Commandments as a law of liberty. You can read in Psalms 119, verse, I think it's 44 and 45. So I will keep your commandments forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty because I seek your precepts. You got laws in Sydney, right? That say you're not supposed to murder. How many of you are thankful for those laws? Are those laws restricting your freedom or does it make it possible for you to walk down the streets after the meeting tonight? That law that per puts a murderer in prison gives you freedom. See what I'm saying? So don't ever look at the law. The devil wants us to think the law is restricting our freedom. It really protects our freedom. We think about the traffic signal. We call them stoplights. Well, they're not just stoplights. They're also go lights. You watch how the traffic stops if they all stop working. When they're working, they're go lights, aren't they? If there's chaos without them. We need organization and order in our lives. We need law and discipline in our lives. And God knows you cannot be happy. You cannot be successful without law. And yet even Christians now are criticizing the law of God as though it's a bad thing. The Bible does not say that. That's a doctrine of devils. The Bible says, fear God and keep his commandments. By the way, these are the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. Fear God and keep his commandments. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. It's by the law we're ultimately judged. That's why it's important that we have Christ inside, that we've been forgiven of our past disobedience of God's law. And again, Revelation 13, 15. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. We're doing uh, emphasis on prophecy here. How many of you have heard about the beast and the mark of the beast? I just read a passage from Revelation 13. This is the principal passage. Those who do not worship the beast and its image in the last days will be killed. People will be compelled to worship an image. What's wrong with that? Ten Commandments say don't do it. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is a hero because he's told to pray to the king or he goes to a lion's den. First Commandment says you shall not have other gods before me. Daniel has to decide, am I going to obey the law of God or am I going to obey the law of men? He puts the law of God first. Works a, God works a great miracle for him. God sends an angel to protect Daniel because he stands up for God and his law. This same scenario is going to be acted out in the last days and God's eyes are going to and fro through the earth looking for somebody in the last days who still believes in his word that will stand up for him when everybody else is going and swimming upside down. You know what an oxymoron is? It's two words that kind of contradict themselves. Like pretty ugly or military intelligence or jumbo shrimp. It's kind of opposite, isn't it? <laughs> and so the Ten Commandments is very important. Just because everybody else is acting like they're ten suggestions or ten recommendations, that's not what God said. He didn't say there were ten good ideas. I've been to some cities where the lines in the road are sort of suggestions. No one pays attention to it. But uh, in God's economy, His law is not just a suggestion. Now, you look in the world around us today, and you can see some of the fallout of that. I actually know a pastor. One time, they had the Ten Commandments on the wall in his Sunday school class, and he went in when he took over this pastor, and he said, that's legalism, and he took it out of his church. It's no wonder there's confusion about what the will of God is and, and rampant crime in our culture. Exhibit A is there's a, a violent crime surge, 560% illegitimate illegitimate births during that same period of time I just quoted 400% divorce 400% single parent homes teenage suicide and I could go on and on with statistics but I don't think I need to I think everyone here knows that it's not going the right direction could there be a connection between we're not teaching the basic principles of the law of God the average 18 year old has to do some with what we're watching and listening to the average 18 year old has witnessed 200,000 violent acts, including 40,000 murders on television. Just one program after the other. And they go to the movies and it's one shooting violent scene. Or, you know, let's face it, friends, on television they act. Uh, sex is like shaking hands. The idea of 
biblical relationships and dating and marriage before there's that intimacy, it's considered Victorian and antiquated. And, and uh, after all, we've evolved. We're just animals. Let's admit it and act like them. That's the attitude of the world. That's not what the Bible teaches. And then, of course, we don't need to talk about corporate crime in high places. It's not enough that you've only got $10 million. Someone else has got a billion. And so you want to steal from the people so that you can get a billion too. The average American is overweight. Diabetes, heart disease are skyrocketing because of the way that we're living. That's why we got a health crisis. Instead of a person getting old and dying in the last couple of years of their life, they spend the last 30 years of their life dying. And so that just is bankrupting the medical system. And you know what the other problem is? People are suing for everything, and the, the attorneys are getting millions of dollar settlements for somebody that you know, gets a blister, and uh, it just is bankrupting the insurance companies. And no one wants to address what the real problems are. It's just greed. One of the commandments, covetousness. Number five, can God's law, the Ten Commandments, ever be changed or abolished? What does the Bible say? Is it still in effect? Psalm 111, verse 7 and 8, all of His commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. When God says it twice like that, it's settled. His commandments, His word. He wrote it with His finger in stone. Why would He change it? He didn't write it in whipped cream. He wrote it in stone with His finger. That would be the one thing that doesn't change. The Lord says, I am the Lord. I change not. Spoke it with his voice, Malachi 3, 6. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the thing that has gone forth from my lips. The Ten Commandments is called the covenant of God. Now we'll talk in a moment about the distinction between the new and the old covenant, so there's no confusion about that. Luke 16, verse 17. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away, Jesus said, than for one tittle of the law. Tittles are equivalent to crossing a T in the Hebrew characters. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for the slightest little dot or stroke in the words of the law to fail. And one reason we know that's true is even in Revelation, last book in the New Testament, it says, I saw the temple of God open in heaven, and the ark of His covenant was seen in His temple. Here it is looking down in time. This is Revelation 11. Prophecies looking down in time here at the future, long after the time of Christ. The ark of God. What's in the ark? Is, is God impressed with a golden box? Or right, what's in that box? That's the important thing. It means it would be honored. It would be glorified. It's in heaven. If it was done away with, it would be somewhere else. The Word of God has not changed. The law of God has not changed. The law of God does not need changing. You know what needs changing? The purpose of the gospel is that we might be new creatures, that God might create within us new hearts, that we might be transformed. Romans chapter 12, by the renewing of your mind, that we might not be conformed to the world, but that we might be transformed. We're what needs changing. The law is not a problem. It's when we're breaking the law, then, then there's a problem. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, going back to my illustration before, if this shows me that there's a problem and it makes me go looking for the blood of Christ, then if you were the devil, would you want people to find out about this? So if you don't want people to find out about this, then you sure don't want them to look in here. So the devil has been working overtime in these last days, to try to minimize or marginalize the law of God so the people will not be aware of their need for the forgiveness and the power and the grace of Jesus. He hates the law. And he's, he's engaged in an all-out war against the law of God. And you know where he's waging that war? In the churches. It's shameful to even utter those words. But even in the church, pastors are saying, oh, I don't want to hear about the law. Law is all done away with, and they don't know what they're talking about when they say that. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The devil hates it because it converts people. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. These are the words of Paul in the New Testament. Why would you get rid of something that is just and holy and good? Number six, did Jesus abolish the law while he was here on earth? What does Christ say? Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill. What does that mean? 
Fulfill does not mean do away with. I mean, why would Jesus say, don't think that I came to do away with the law. I didn't come to do away with it, but to do away with it. Fulfill means to fill it full. It doesn't mean to empty it or to get rid of it. Christ in his life, he kept the law. Not so that we don't have to. He kept it in our behalf to show us that it can be done. Christ did not overcome with any power that is not available to you and me through prayer. All of heaven can be open to us through prayer. He wants to give us victorious lives. I'll be sharing a little more with you tomorrow night when I share my personal testimony, but hey, I'm speaking from experience. I don't claim perfection. Please don't misunderstand, but by the grace of God, I mean, I was drinking and smoking and stealing and lying and living immorally, and the Lord has saved me from so many things. Why would I give the devil more credit to tempt me to sin then God gets credit to keep me from sin. Why would someone want to glorify the ability of the devil to make us and tempt us to sin more than the ability of God to give us victory? And yet even in the churches, there are masters among ministers at making excuses for sin, and we need more who will stand up and say, God can save you from your sin. God can change you. God can give you a new life. He can give you victory. You can be a new creature. That's the message that comes from recognizing the law doesn't change, but by the grace of God, we can change. That's what's in that golden box. It's the law of God is good, it's just, it's holy. Even Jesus, who's our example, John 15, 10, he said, I have kept my Father's commandments. And again, 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22, Christ also suffered for us, giving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Notice, who committed no sin. Did Jesus ever break the law? You know, some of his enemies accused him of breaking the law. They lied. They also accused him of being a drunkard and a glutton. He wasn't, and they accused him of being demon-possessed. So some people have pointed to the accusations of the Pharisees. They, they pointed to Jesus and said, he broke the law. Well, he broke their traditions. But that wasn't the Ten Commandments. Jesus never broke the law. That would have been sin. He did no sin. You know, another reason God can't break his own law, the law of God is a perfect reflection of the character of God. Look at this list I've got here. I'll have two slides for you. On one side, you see descriptions of the characteristics of God. On the other side, you'll find the verses that say characteristics of the law. They are identical. Be careful about sweeping away the law of God. You might find you sweep him away with it like people that throw out the baby with the bathwater. It says, God is good in Luke chapter 18, verse 19. Romans 7, 12 says, the law is good. Isaiah 5, 16, God is holy. Romans 7, 12, the law is holy. Deuteronomy 32, 4, God is just. Romans 7, 12, God is, uh, the law is just. It says, God is perfect. The law is perfect. God is love. The law is love. God is righteous, the law is righteous. God is truth, the law is truth. God is pure, the law is pure. God is spiritual, the law is spiritual. God is eternal, the law is eternal. All of the things that describe the character of God in the Bible describe His Word and His law. See, Jesus was the embodiment of the Word. Christ said, He that hears these words of mine and does them, He's like a wise man who builds his house on what? Rock. What were the Ten Commandments written on? It was the Word of God written on rock. Christ is called the rock of ages. In sweeping aside the law, people are finding that they're sweeping aside the Lord. It's an expression of who He is. Number seven, can people who willingly continue to break one of God's commandments be saved? Well, that's, notice the wording is very important. Those who willingly continue. The Bible says the penalty for sin is death. It's very serious. That's why Jesus came. We just can't keep going on like the multitude. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. God's called you here because he wants you to find life. But you first got to realize you got duct tape on your face. And the mirror is going to help us see that. And then we go to the blood of Christ for cleansing and power. Amen. There's power in the blood. And again, 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4 now by this we know that we know him, eternal life is knowing him, if we keep his commandments. And again, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So a lot of people out there saying, Lord, Lord, and God's going to say, I don't know you. You know that uh, verse there in Matthew? 
Many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, we've taught on your streets and we cast out devils. We did many wonderful works and he'll declare unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I don't know you. What does that mean? Workers of iniquity. It says, depart from me, ye lawless. That's what it says in the original. They're living without the law, going through all the religious motions. They've got a form of godliness and no power. Where do you see the power of God? In changed lives. What is the greatest demonstration that Jesus is real? When a person who is a drunk for years and their lives are a mess and they're abusing their families and they can't keep a job, they find Christ and they quit drinking and they quit abusing their family and they get a job and they hold it down, they clean the front yard. That's the evidence of the gospel. It changes people. That's why it's good news. And it gives hope and purpose. Number eight, can anyone be saved by keeping the law? Very important. I've been talking about the law, but are we saved by keeping it? Does the mirror wash away the dirt? No. Again, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me illustrate. I'm driving down the road. Happened, as a matter of fact, not too long ago. Happened to me several times. And I look in my rear view mirror and I see those flashing red and blue lights. I, you know, like some of you got lead foot or something. And so, but I'm in a hurry. I don't want to pull over. So I ignore it. Is that what you do? I felt absolutely fine going my merry way until I saw those lights. What do you have to do when you see those lights behind you? You've either got to pull over or get into a high speed chase and they'll pull you over, but you're not going to get away, Right? I don't want to pull over, but as soon as I see those lights, I'm now under the law. I'm under the penalty of the law. I am under the authority of the law. So I pull over. Policeman comes over to the window. And I said, officer, can you please have mercy on me? I said, you know, uh, I, I, my insurance is going to go up. My wife's going to give me a hard time. And I just I said, give them all these excuses. And, you know, they say it pays if you cry right about then. I tried that once <laughs> and she didn't give me a ticket. And you asked for mercy. I was coming back actually from a funeral. I had to drive six hours. Um, I drove actually longer than that. And I got pulled over and I told the officer, I said, officer, I said, and I was in my suit. I said, I am coming back from a funeral of a dear friend. I said, can you give me a break today? I said, it's been a tough day. And he started, he said, what was your friend's name? I told him. How old was he? I told him. How'd he die? I told him. He could tell from the questions that I was telling the truth. He said, okay, slow down. He let me go. So as soon as I hear him say, you can go. Now he's got me on radar. I was going 70 miles an hour. It's not like your kilometers. I was going fast. As soon as he says, you can go, I have just received grace. He doesn't need to tell me that. According to the law, I'm guilty. I get the ticket. I pay the fine. So when he says, all right, I'm going to show you grace this time. What would really be nice if he said, tell you what, I'll pay your ticket for you. But they don't do that. That's what Jesus did. He said, I'm going to show you grace. So now that I'm under grace and I'm no longer under the law, I say, praise the Lord. I am no longer under the law. And just as the policeman's walking away from my car, I rev my engine. And I put it into second gear and I pop the clutch and I squeal away the tires burning, gravel flying all over in the hood of that police car because I'm now under grace. Is that what I do? Oh, no. Now that I've been forgiven, I uh, make sure my seatbelt buckled. Had to unbuckle it to get my license out. You can tell I've got experience with this. And I put on my blinker. And I look both ways and I clean off my rear view mirror to watch for other blue lights that might appear. And I slowly pull out 10 miles an hour and I am real careful to stay under the speed limit. Why? Because I'm under grace now. And that usually works for a little while. When I've been forgiven like that, I'm real careful the rest of the day. I appreciate they've shown me mercy. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Yet some people say because Jesus died, we can now speed. We can drive any way we want. Because of the sacrifice and grace of Jesus, the law doesn't change. It's still there. We live new kinds of lives. Number nine, why then is the law necessary? 
We pretty much covered this principle. Romans 7, 7. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Here Paul is quoting from the Ten Commandments. And again, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, I'm not telling you these things tonight to make you feel bad. I know that everybody here, we've all sinned many, many times. Varying degrees, but it's all fatal. And there's only one solution. We need to have our sins forgiven. Past sins are forgiven. Someone asked about this. But I not only want my past record washed away, I need power now to live a new life from day to day. Isn't that right? So God, in the sacrifice of Christ, He not only washes the past record so that you, when you get off your knees and you've repented and confessed your sins, you stand up, you now have a fresh life. All the guilt and shame of the past is gone. But, hey, you still got all those memories and habits. Now what? The power and blood of Christ gives you a new dynamic. It gives you the ability to be new creatures, a new motivation of love. So presently, the grace of God helps you walk in a newness of life, the Bible says. And then, if I do slip in the future, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So that grace is continually applied as we grow in sanctification. Not the hearers of the law, Paul said, are just in the sight of God. This is Romans 2.13, very clear verse. Not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law are justified. We're not justified by doing the law, but doing the law indicates we have been changed. Let me see if I could put it to you another way. When the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, did He give them the Ten Commandments before He saved them or after He saved them? See how you're, if you watch the movie, The Ten Commandments. I want to see what you're Bible history is like. The Ten Commandments, do they happen in Egypt or does he give them the Ten Commandments after he saves them from slavery? So you're not saved by keeping the law. What did they have to do? They did have to obey and sacrifice a lamb before they got out of Egypt. If you want to be saved from the slavery of sin, you have to accept the Lamb of God. Then after you're saved, then he brings us to Mount Sinai. He says, now if you love me, here's my law. Even in the Ten Commandments, it says that right there in the beginning. It says, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am the one who saved you. Now, if you love me, here's my law. And he, he lists the Ten Commandments. So they're saved. We come to him just like we are by the Lamb, that Passover Lamb, Jesus. Then after they're saved, then he says, here's my law. Do you really love me? Trust me. Obey me. Again, not the Ten Suggestions. Number 10, what enables a truly converted Christian to follow the pattern of God's law? How do we follow this pattern, this new law? Answer, God sending his son in uh, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Christ came not only to give us an example, he came to show us what the father's like, but there on the cross, he lived a perfect life right up to the end. He said, it is finished. And because he was victorious, we can be victorious. You see, you and I genetically are defective. When Adam sinned, something, I don't know if it's a DNA or what it is. I mean, but let's face it. Every human, we're born with this natural selfish tendency. That's the first Adam. Christ is the second Adam. Through his successful life, you know, Adam fell in a garden. Jesus overcame in a desert when he was tempted by the devil. He's the second Adam. Through his successful life, and the, the cross is a tree of life, by the way, you and I now become infused with a new power. There's a new dynamic to be new creatures. How do we get that? You believe. You have faith. And it happens. Be it unto you, Jesus said, according to your faith. If you believe that Christ is in you and his spirit is with you and that he's forgiven you, I'll tell you what, friends, if you know that you're on your way to heaven, just picture for a minute. Let me illustrate this. I got to use both hands, so I put that down. You're walking along the street one day and you, just like the typical world, and in your conscience, you know that you're not living right and you're guilty and you wonder if you're going to be saved because of the record of sin. And all of a sudden, an angel appears to you. And he says, you know, I've been sent with good news. I've got here in my hand a golden key 
This golden key will guarantee your access to heaven. As soon as you take this key into your hand, all your past sins are forgiven. You now have everlasting life. Don't let go of it. If you want to sin, you've got to let the devil hold your key. And then the angel disappears after placing this beautiful golden key in your hand. And he says, this key, as long as you keep this in your possession, you now are going to live forever. You will be ready when Jesus comes or you're going to get your glorified body. Just hang on to that key. How closely would you keep that key? Would you ever leave it at home when you went to work? Wouldn't you want to keep it on your person? You'd probably chain it, duct tape it to your body somehow, right? So let's suppose your problem is uh, alcohol. I'll just pick that. Let's say cigarettes. I've been picking on alcohol. Let's pick on cigarettes for a second. Oh, by the way, I think there are probably going to be people in heaven that smoke because they didn't know any better, but we know better now, right? I don't know about here, but in America, it says right on the pack, this stuff's going to kill you. And that's one of the commandments. Don't kill, including yourself. Okay, so you're in the supermarket, and you're just there to get your bananas, but you see the cigarettes and you want to get the cigarettes and you kind of staring at the cigarettes and all of a sudden, poof, the devil appears. He said, sure, you help yourself. I'll hold your key for you. You want a cigarette? You can trust me. How many of you would be tempted to smoke a cigarette if you knew you had to let the devil hold your key? Would it be easier to say, no, I think I can go a little longer. If you believe you've got everlasting life, it's a lot easier to say no to temptation, friends. See what I'm saying? But a lot of us never really believe it. And so we say, oh, what difference does it make? I'm probably not saved anyway. And the devil tempts us to give up. In the word of God, you've got a golden key. It's a promise of God. Don't let go of it. Walk in a newness of life. And whenever you do sin, then you feel bad and you go to go hunting around and that angel, you never know if that angel's going to appear again. You're playing Russian roulette with eternity every time you sin. Oh, I better rush along here. I'm becoming enchanted by my own voice and forgetting my slides. All right. Again, Romans 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Why do we obey God? Because sin hurts him. If you doubt that, look at the cross. How much does sin hurt Jesus? If you love me. I heard about a, uh, a guy that was uh, just a... He was a real scoundrel. He'd go out drinking and carousing and gambling every night and never brought any money home. And he'd come staggering up the street, being very loud and obnoxious every night. And he'd come pounding on the door. His wife would become exasperated. She'd lock him out. And he'd pound on the door and he'd start to bellow and call and say, Oh, honey, I'm sorry. Just give me another chance. He'd, I got three words for you. I love you. I love you. Let me in. I love you. She'd eventually relent and she'd come down and open the door and he'd do the same thing. For too long. And one day she got so tired of it, he started shouting out the three little words, I love you. And she opened the window and said, I got two words for you. Prove it. Prove it. We say we love the Lord. We love the Lord. How do you show you love the Lord? By crucifying him afresh? Or by walking in a newness of life? Be willing to do his will. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. It's like this. The two commandments are summarized in the ten. Two great commandments. The first four commandments, by the way, the ten commandments are written on two tables of stone. Those two tables represent the word of God. You might call it the law and the prophets. New Testament, it's dual. It's a sword with two edges. It's like the two witnesses in Revelation 11. It's like Moses and Elijah. The word of God is always dual in its nature. It gives you perspective. Like the illustration I did with Pastor Gary. You get two feet planted, you got more foundation. And so the two commandments of God, or the ten commandments of God are on these two tables of stone. First four commandments are on the first table. They represent your love relationship to God. Don't have other gods before me. Don't bow down to graven images. Don't use God's name in vain. Remember that holy time with God. That's your relationship with God. The last six commandments deal with your relationship with your fellow man. Honor your father and mother. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't bear false witness. Uh, don't uh, covet. That represents your relationship with your fellow man. Love to God. Love to man. It's this love relationship. And it's this love relationship. And that represents a cross. The Ten Commandments are all summarized in love. 
How do you show love? I got two arms. Love God, love my fellow man. Got ten fingers. I demonstrate my love for God and my love for my fellow man with my, my life, my actions. So where you go? You got ten toes, two legs. Just think about that now. That's why God gave you ten toes and ten fingers. So you could count on your toes and on your fingers. Ten commandments. This represents your walk in your life. You walk in His commandments. This represents your actions. See, everybody can understand that. I took theology in kindergarten. <laughs> all right, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. You should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the great commandment, Jesus said, and the second is like unto it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Again, first four deal with love for God. The second table deals with love for our fellow man. And I'll tell you why this is really important. In the last days, it says that law must be written on our hearts. It must be in our hands. It must be in our head. Or we'll have the mark of the beast in our hands or in our forehead. I'll get to that another night. I'll show you those scriptures. Number 11. But isn't a Christian living under grace freed from keeping the law? Oh, nothing could be further from the truth. Paul said, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. If we have faith, we don't disobey. We follow him. And again, Paul says in Romans 3, 31, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? He says, God forbid, don't even think that. Yes, we're living under grace. That's because we've been forgiven. Now we're more careful than anybody to obey because we love God. And again, Romans, uh, I think I skipped my next question rather. Number 12, are the Ten Commandments reaffirmed in the New Testament? Absolutely, many times. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 17, if you would enter into life, keep the commandments. Only, now we're not saved by doing it, but he was telling people that that's the criteria by what we're being judged. See, the law doesn't tell us, you're not saved by keeping the law. The law tells whether or not you are saved. If a person is out robbing and stealing and killing and they're murdering and, and they say, oh yeah, I've been saved. It's like the Baptist preacher, Todi Campola, got robbed once on some city street and the man was asking for his wallet. And while the robbers got his gun out of him, he said, what do you do? He said, I'm a minister. And the crook said, oh, I'm a Christian too. <laughs> I tell you, a lot of people think that way. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, verse 12, many times in the New Testament. Revelation ends, the Bible ends by saying, Revelation 22:14, 14, blessed, I want you to be blessed, friends. Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city. What about God's law compared with Moses' law? Are they the same thing? Now here's where people get confused. There is a distinction in the Bible between the Ten Commandments and the ceremonial laws and ordinances of Moses. For instance, Deuteronomy 4.13. It says, God declared unto you His covenant which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments. So the covenant of God is the Ten Commandments. But Moses goes on to say, and he wrote them on two tables of stone, and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them in the land you cross over to possess. You've got the Ten Commandments written on stone, God's finger, spoken by God's voice, and Moses said, I gave you statutes and judgments and the ceremonial laws and the ordinances. Again, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 8. There are two different laws that are being talked about here. Only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and ordinances by the hand of Moses. You got the finger of God, Ten Commandments, hand of Moses. One written by hand, one written by finger. The ceremonial laws have been abolished, they are nailed to the cross, having abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Do we need to sacrifice lambs anymore? No. The Bible says circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments is what matters. That's what Paul said. It's the ceremonial laws that have been done away with, not the Ten Commandments. It's the law of um, ordinances and the yearly Sabbaths, the meat offerings, drink offerings, 
that revolved around the Levitical priesthood and the, or the uh, priesthood of Aaron and the, um, the Levites. Number 14. So what is the difference between the old and the new covenant? Well, I sort of illustrated this. He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the 10 commandments. And he wrote them on two tables of stone. Now you remember when Moses got the 10 commandments from the Lord, he said, you better get down the mountain. Why? Children of Israel had gotten into some trouble before they got tired of waiting for Moses. And they, what did they make a golden calf? And they began to break all of God's commandments right then and there. And so God said, look, you made a promise when I gave you the 10 commandments, you said, all the Lord has said, we will do. They broke the covenant. They broke the agreement. So God said in the old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 31 is where you first find the new covenant. God makes a new covenant. He says, tell you what, the old covenant, you said, we'll do it, Lord. New covenant, God, God says, no, you can't do it. I will do it. I will write my law in your heart. Same law. That's why it says in Hebrews 8, 8, finding fault with them. The fault with the old covenant was not the law. It was with the people, with them. Finding fault with them, he said, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. By the way, is there any covenant that God makes anywhere in the Bible with the Gentiles? Covenant is made with the Jews. That's why you need to become a spiritual Jew. The new covenant is made with the house of Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. So, like I said to you last night, you just all became adopted into the family of uh, spiritual Israel. I'll put my law in their mind and write them in their hearts. How does a devil feel about people who follow the Ten Commandments? He didn't like it very much. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was enraged with a woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. What are the characteristics that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus? The devil hates the law of God. He hates those that obey it. Because whenever you're transformed through the grace of God, it's an evidence of the power of God that you've been snatched from the burning by Jesus. And the devil hates that, that you become a new creature. You know, God is a God of love. He's our heavenly father, but he's also a righteous king. He's got a law that is unchangeable. And unless we allow him to change us, he can't save us. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, if we continue to sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sin. After God gives his son to save us, what more can he do? Man was driving down the road one day, small town, and he got pulled over. He sort of recognized the policeman. And so as the policeman came over to his window, he was, you know, kind of irritated with himself that in a hurry, you know, it's terrible. You get pulled over speeding and then the policeman slows you down. You're even later now. And you got to drive even slower. So he rolls down the window and, and he says, oh, you know, I, I, sorry, I was in a hurry and I just got to go and say, can I have your information, please? And he hands him his license and he says, oh, come on, can't you just show me mercy just this once? Policeman goes back to the car and he starts to write and he gets so mad. He says, oh, he's going to give me a ticket, you know, and he folds his arms and he's just steaming mad. Policeman comes back over and the guy won't even roll his window down all the way, just cracks his window a little bit, takes back his wallet and his license and takes a slip of paper. Policeman drives away and he looks. It's not a ticket. It's a note. Policeman had read his name, sort of recognized him. And he said, Bob, he said, my daughter was hit by someone speeding four years ago and killed. He said, I've had an awful hard time forgiving that person. He said, but I'm going to try one more time to forgive them by forgiving you. Please slow down. Whew. Man read that. And uh, all of a sudden, his whole attitude changed. He realized that speeding for him was not just an inconvenience, that someone had lost a life because of it. Jesus is not asking us to just slow down. Heard another story about a man who came up to a uh, stop sign and didn't really stop. They call them California stops. He kind of rolled through it. Policeman pulled him over. And the man began to argue with the policeman. He's got a convertible. He's in a hurry. And he said, oh, come on, officer. He said, I slowed way down. He says, but it's a stop sign, sir. He said, but it's the same thing. Slow down, stop. It's just, I mean, I slowed down. I saw the, he said, it's not the same. He said, it's just the same thing. Policeman snapped. He'd had enough. 
he took out his billy club and began to thump the guy over the head. He said, do you want me to slow down or stop? <laughs> so when it comes to the Ten Commandments, friend, is God wanting us to get the victory? He's wanting us to be new creatures. Sin is what hurts you with your children. Do you want them to just cut down on their drugs or stop? Do you want them to just slow down on the things that are hurting them or get a new life? God feels that way about his children. He wants you to be blessed. His commandments are all about love for him. Don't let the devil fool you into thinking that you can't be a new creature. Yes, you can. You have more faith in the devil or God? Can God give you a new heart? All things are possible. Take it one day at a time, friends. You can be a new creature. I wanted this presentation about what's in the ark to penetrate tonight because it really sets the stage for everything else. The great battle of prophecy between the dragon and the woman is between those who obey God that don't bow down and worship the beast in his image. Very foundation, friends. If you don't get this straight, nothing else is going to make sense. God wants you to be a, a people that will honor him recognizing Jesus died for our sins. He died for our disobedience. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can do it with him in you. All things of power are possible through Christ. Do you believe that? Number 16, do you want to ask God to help you fully obey his law? The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Would you like to ask him for strength to be a new creature as we close tonight? I'm going to ask again. I need it every day, friends. Why don't we stand together and we'll pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, as we think about the incredible sacrifice that Jesus made, they are concentrated in the events around the cross. Jesus took every ounce of suffering that we deserve for all the sins that are compounded through our lives. Lord, we thank you for this. Help us to appreciate how much you must love us. Help us to show that love and appreciation by being willing to drive differently, to walk differently, to be new creatures. I pray that you'll bless each of these people in their homes, bless them in their hearts. Place within their hands that golden key, Lord. Help them know the gift of everlasting life through your blood is available right now as they come in faith. I pray as we go from this place, we'll know we're not alone. You've promised to be with us always. Bless us, dear Lord, and bring us back again that we might prepare for eternity. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.